Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, yes, <laughs> exactly. Those of you that have been here for the last four weeks um, to hear from 1 Thessalonians, understand why I feel like a one-string banjo, because we're back there again. And um, just to quickly point out the things that I said at the end this morning about this church, they were a sound church, right? They were doctrinally sound. They were, they were an outgoing and loving church. They had done all these things that evidenced a true work of grace in their hearts. So much so that the apostle says in verse 4 of chapter number, number 1, Brethren, I know your election of God. I know you're God's people. I don't have any doubt about that. But we closed our, our uh, message this morning with, uh, even though you're sound, I want you to abound. Right? You've got to continue to progress on. Growth is the evidence of life, right? And so we must continue to become more, like, become more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, right? It's the work of the Spirit of God within us. It's a work that we can't resist, that we must not resist it. And I told you guys, and I'm not going to get into all this this morning, but read, we stopped, you know, somewhere in chapter number 3, and, and if you read on in the book of Thessalonians, I guess we actually stopped at the beginning of chapter number 4. But after he's established the soundness of this church, how solid they are, you're going to be shocked at some of the things that he brings up as he instructs them and says, watch out for this. And you would think, I wouldn't think a church like that would ever have any issue there. And so the, 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 the message that's been on my heart as I was drawn to this text, which has been on my heart for several weeks now, and is what, is what we gave as the title to our, uh, to our series it was prove all things, and that comes from chapter number five. So I want to go over there and consider that verse in the context in which it's presented to us. Prove all things. In 1 Thessalonians chapter five, he says in verse, and, and, and here's something that I've never done with this text. You know, we've got a lot of sort of, you know, we've got these kind of one-shot things, it seems like, these kind of disconnected thoughts, you know, like rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, you know. And those are truths that can stand all by themselves, right? We can just stand and meditate on that and benefit from that if we just took that verse all by itself and said rejoice evermore, I need to do that. Give thanks in everything, I need to do that, right? But when you consider again, and I told Brother Gene this morning, I said it's, it's, What's helped me so what's what's been such a blessing to me in this is to consider this book as an entire letter that Paul wrote to a specific people in a specific situation and to understand the apostle's heart towards that group before we begin to see these things that he instructed them concerning. And so with an awareness of how sound they were and how faithful they were, yet he still felt a burden to preach to them these things and to teach them concerning these things. And so in verse number 19, he, said, he warns them of this, quench not the spirit, right? As sound as you are, you can still quench the spirit. We can resist the Holy Ghost. We know that. We're instructed not to do that. I'm talking about a people that has the Holy Ghost in them, right? Can quench and resist the Holy Ghost. I, I want you to put 19 through 22 together in your mind. That I want you to see that as kind of one unit, and that's what I want to consider this morning. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. Now, don't get, don't get confused when you hear that word prophesying, because prophesying, yes, there are specific times in scriptures that prophesying is talking specifically about a revelation concerning something that is to come, right? Prophecy refers to that at times. But often, especially in the New Testament, we're just talking about declaring the word of God, right? We're talking about giving the people what God has told us to say. That which God has led his ministers to preach. And also that which is the inspired word of God that we have in our New Testament. Remember, they didn't have the New Testament yet. So despise, not prophesize. Now here's our, here's our thought. Prove how many things? All, All things. It would be an appropriate rendering of this te text to say, test everything. I mean, that's what the word prove means. It means to test. Test it all. 
Test all things. And as you test all these things, when you find that which is good, what ought you to do to it? According to the next portion of the verse. Hold it fast. Right? If you test it and you see it good, if, if, you, if you're faithful like the Bereans were and, and you heard what the apostles preached and you said, we're going to search the scriptures to see if it's so, and we searched the scriptures and we found that it was so, hold on to that. Right? But sometimes, some of the things that you're going to hear and some of the things that you're going to observe are going to be contrary to that. And so what does the next verse say you need to do with that? Abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, if you look that up in most of the, more, the, the translations that didn't come out in the 1600s, right, that tried to put it in more the way that we would speak today, you're going to find that most of those read something like this. Abstain from every form of of evil. And so what I want you to what what I want you to get with that is when you say abstain from all appearance of evil, we immediately think the way that that's phrased, we think well that's talking about doing something that even though it's not necessarily wrong, it might appear to be wrong. Right? And is there is is that valid? I mean, should we refrain from that which would cause our brother to stumble even if what we're doing is totally acceptable before God as far as me and God are concerned? Yes. There's plenty of scriptures that talk about that, right? Concerning, remember, eat, eating meat offered to idols, and if it offends my brother, right? Even though I'm not doing anything wrong because I can eat that with a clear conscience, and yet for his sake, because it appears to be evil to him, I'm going to refrain from that, right? And so that, that's a valid thought in this verse right here, but I don't want you to limit it to just, just that. And I want us to understand it's actually a much broader thought than that. And what it's really saying is abstain from evil in every form. Every way that it presents itself. You are light and you are not darkness, right? And so separate yourself from darkness wherever that darkness is. Abstain from every form of evil. And so do that as we are testing all things, right? Test it all. If it's good, embrace it. Hold it fast, right? If it, even if it's, if it's good and it's something that you were uncomfortable with, right? If it's good and it's something that, oh, that's kinda, that kind of hits me where I am and it's not, uh, that's kind of hard for me to hear because, you know what, I haven't been exactly like that. But if it's good, do what? Hold it fast. And as you're testing all things, if you see that it be evil, abstain from it. Do you see how it's connected now? Yeah. I never understood the connection between all of that. I never saw that. And so I want us to just, just to understand the context of this passage here just a little bit. Go back and read. You're going to find out Paul, and Paul spent like, what is it? I wrote it down. Six verses warning them about abstaining from sexual immorality in chapter 4. And again, I'm thinking, as solid as this church is, do you really need to tell them that? Yeah, we need to tell one another that, Right? He warns them about being lazy and not working. Really? They need to know? Yeah. Yeah, we need to know that, right? Because I don't care how much any of us know anything. None of us know it as well as we ought to know it, right? None of us are doing it perfectly. We're not we don't look exactly like Jesus Christ yet. And all of us, there are areas that we can slip into. That's why it says over there in Galatians is it Galatians 5 or 6 1? I think it's 5 1. You know, about restoring one that's called in a, in, a, in a trespass, restoring them in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Right? And so, th that's, those are the things that he's writing to this church, a church that's solid and sound. And you're thinking, well, they don't, surely they don't need to hear that, Paul. Let's back up a little bit in this text and see if we can understand the context a little bit. So he's talking about light and darkness, be children of light, called out of darkness. That goes well with our thought about abstaining from every form of evil. Comfort yourselves, verse, verse 11, together and edify one another, even as you also do. Have a care and a love for one another, for one another's good. I want what's best for you as my brother and as my sister, as an individual that comes within this congregation. That is our desire. And listen to verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Now, who's that talking about? Anyone? That's our pastors, right? Those are the men that God has called to instruct us. That's those that God has given the ability to 
be apt to teach, right? Has given his word to to share with the people. And so, uh, brethren, recognize those men, those men that God has called to admonish you that are over you. They bear rule, not in, not in their uh, taskmaster keeping you in line, but they bear rule through the preaching of the word of God. And so what should you do because of that? Verse 13, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. You ought to appreciate those brothers. You ought to esteem them very highly in love. Why? Because they're laboring for your souls. They're, they're, they're the ones that Paul said upon us greater condemnation will come, right? Because we're, don't, don't Try to be many teachers. Don't try to be many masters because on the masters, the greater condemnation comes. Why? Because they got to give an account, not just for themselves, but all those souls that were under them. And so esteem them highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Appreciate the gift that God has given them and, and the difficulty of the task that they have. And how they have to get up uh, week after week and really day after day. And they have to say, Lord, what would you have me to say to this people? And then they've got to have the courage and the faithfulness to say it, right? And so he says in verse number 14, understanding these things, now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, all of those things are things that happen within the body of Jesus Christ. We will have to deal with unruliness. We will have to deal with feebleness, feeble-mindedness. We will have to deal with weakness. Be what you're supposed to be in all of those instances. And that's the whole church. That includes all of us, right? Be that brother or be that sister that comes alongside that ones and like it says in Galatians 5 and helps restore them, right? When there's unruliness. Be the one that when you, you see a weakness that maybe everybody else is oblivious to, you're the one that comes alongside them and supports them in that. But in all of these things, what does the end of the verse say? Be patient toward all. In all of it, you have to approach it with the patience of understanding, hey, this could be me, Right? And man, brothers and sisters have come along beside me. You know, I, I, I've been a Paulus before where all I know is the baptism of John, right? And a Priscilla and Aquila came along and said, hey, let me show you the way of Christ more perfectly. Praise God for that, right? Thank God for those brothers and sisters that have loved us and cared for us in that fashion. So now you turn around and do that too. Being patient towards all as you warn and as you comfort and as you support. See that nobody renders evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all. Christians aren't like the rest of the world. Because the rest of the world has their little group, right? And God said, yes, you care for the little group, but you do good to all, right? Do good unto all, and then especially they that are of the household of faith. And you know what? We shouldn't harp too much on either side of that verse, right? We have a responsibility in both. And so he says that here. Follow what's good, both among yourselves and all. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks. If you want to know, if you, you say, I want to do the will of God, there's your verse, right? Verse 18. It's the will of God that you give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And then we hit our text. Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies, prophesying. When the word of God comes to you, see it. I, I don't, it doesn't matter who the vessel is. Brother, Brother Gene, you've said many times, if God gives me a drink of water and it's in a rusty tin cup or whatever, you know, whatever vessel it comes in, I want to drink it down, right? And so receive, don't despise those prophesying. Receive it. But then our text, make sure you do this, that you test it, right? Test how many things? All things. Test everything. Our brother has told us over and over again, don't listen to what I'm saying. Don't hang your salvation on my coattails. We've got Bibles in the pews. You follow along in the word of God and make sure what I'm telling you is accurate. And I'll go a step beyond that. You need to go home and study it out too. Right? Because not everything we always hear sits well with us, right? 
You better go home and find out if that's the Lord. Sometimes things sit really well with us. You know what you still ought to do? Go home and find out if that's of the Lord, right? Test all things. Test it all. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. This is not the church at Thessalonica, but this is a church that was doing well. This is a church that um, there was soundness among them. When you, when you listen to the Apostle Paul address the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, it's clear that his understanding of the state of the church at that time is that they, they were faithful elders among the church. He's just talking to the elders. He was just talking to those that had got God called to teach and instruct in that environment. And, and, he's, and he's telling them, just like he told the Thessalonians, here's what I was when I was among you. You know, I was among you with weeping and crying and tears, and I taught you publicly, and I went from house to house, and I gave you the whole counsel of God. Now you guys be like me, because I did what God told me to do. And so there was soundness in that church, but if you remember, Paul warned them about something when he addressed the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. And he said, I know after I depart what's going to, ha what's going to happen. Grievous wolves, right? Where are the wolves going to come from? From among you. Right? This is, it's not outside pressure that comes. It is inwardly these wolves are going to manifest themselves. Now, we don't have in the book of Acts, we don't see that happening. But I believe we've seen that begin to happen when we get to Revelation chapter 2. And listen to this church in Revelation chapter 2. And unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. You guys despise that any doctrine that's contrary to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're faithful in that. You have labored. I mean, it sounds like the Thessalonian church, right? You've labored and you've exhibited that patience. And, and, and you have been faithful through all of those things. Whenever evil tried to find its way in, you guys were quick to snuff it out. And you found those that were liars, found those to be liars that claimed that they had something from God. And you've borne, in other words, you, 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 didn't, you didn't quit running the race, right? You, you bore these things and you've had patience, you've persevered. And for my name's sake, you have labored and has not fainted. And you kind of expect it to be done at that point. You know, you kind of expect that to be one of these churches that the Lord doesn't really have any charge against and says, you know, hey, he that, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. Because it sounds so good, right? And it's like we saw this morning with the Thessalonian church. They were so sound. But what did I tell you to remember? I apologize for it being so silly, but that's what, the way it sticks in my mind. You are sound, but you need to abound. You need to continue to grow. You need to progress on. And he says, in all of these things that you've done, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Let me tell you how that happens. It happens when you fail to test all things. To see, is this of God? And you just ride along. You just along for the ride. And it creeps in slowly. It creeps in without obvious notice. You know, we wrestle with things in our mind and we're like, well, you know, that's no big deal. We'll just, love covers the multitudes of sins, so we're just going to love through that and we're going to get through it. And slowly, little by little, it creeps in. And it got to the point in this church that looks so great outwardly that they had left their first love. They were, they were good at recognizing false doctrine. They were good at seeing that these churches are doing that and that's wrong. And we're not like that. And, and he goes on to say, you know, in this text, uh, in verse number six, but this thou hast, you know, to your credit, uh, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. This false doctrine that's, that's popped up and is becoming prevalent among other churches, not you guys. You hate that. That's to your credit. And yet you've left your first love. Is that possible? Yeah. And how dangerous is it? How big of a deal is it? Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works. 
or else I will come unto thee quickly. And what will he do? I will remove your candlestick out of its place. Except he's, the Lord says, I'm about to unchurch you. And then verse 7, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You have left your first love. Let me, let me close with this, these two verses, or maybe three verses. We'll see when we get there. 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. This is that group that accused Paul of being hard in his letters and soft in person. But this isn't so hard. And he's reminding them of what the motivation's got to be behind everything that we did. And that's the thing, even when the Apostle Paul, when he had to write those things that were hard, it was motivated by this right here. It was motivated by love. It was motivated by charity. What did the, where did the Ephesian church drop the ball? They had left their first love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and of angels and have not charity, if I have not love, what am I involved in? It's just sound and brass and tinkling cymbal, right? I, I know we know these verses. Don't, don't, turn, don't turn your minds off just because we know these verses, Right? And though I have the gift of prophecy, right? What did we say? Don't despise prophesying. But listen, prophecy all by itself, it can be sound and true and, and straight down the line. And I can understand all mysteries and I can have all knowledge. I could say everything the way that it's supposed to be said. And though I have all faith, there's nothing that shakes me when whatever comes, I trust God that God's going to take care of me through it. So much so that I could remove mountains. But if I don't have charity in any of that, if I've left my first love, what am I? I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, I'm the most giving person you've ever met, right? And though I give my body to be burned, I become a martyr for Jesus Christ and have not charity. It profiteth me nothing. So brothers and sisters, this is what we need to do. Test all things, right? Test all things. It, 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 it doesn't mean that there's not that we're not solid, and it doesn't mean that we're not sound. It doesn't mean that the truth isn't declared here week after week, but it means that we cannot let down our guard and do exactly what our brothers warned us about years after year after year. Right? Don't hang your salvation on my coattails. You seek the Lord for it. test it all. And man, if it's the truth and if it's good, hold on to it. Fight for it. But if it's evil, if it's evil in any form, abstain from it. Amen? Amen. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Love y'all.